Well, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad you guys are here. Uh, if you have a Bible, usually I tell you to grab it and turn to a certain passage of Scripture we're going to walk through. But today we've got a lot of passages, so I want to tell you to download the Grace Church app. And there's a sermon notes section that's going to have every one of these Scriptures on there as we roll through today. Uh, in the 1986 movie called Hoosiers, there's a classic scene. A few Indiana people in the house. Yes. Uh, there's a classic scene where this small town group makes it to the state championship, and when they show up at the gym where the state championship game is being held, the team is paralyzed. The vision is too big, the gym is too big, the seats are too many, and so the coach has a player measure the hoop to see that it's still 10 feet tall because that's how tall all basketball hoops are. And so he's telling his team, even though the vision of this seems overwhelming, stay with the basics. It's still a 10-foot hoop. The free throw line's the same. The three-point line's the same. Don't be overwhelmed by all of this. It's still the same game. Go back to the basics. Uh, legend has it that Vince Lombardi, the coach of the Green Bay Packers, he would start every single spring training by holding up a football and telling his team, gentlemen, this is a football. If you don't know anything about the Packers, uh, they were back-to-back -back Super Bowl champs in the 60s. Lombardi is widely considered the greatest football coach to ever do it. And he would start spring training by telling professional football players who had just won back-to-back -back Super Bowls, gentlemen, this is a football. So going back to the basics is often the best way to have vision. Again, sometimes vision is big and it's innovative and it's exciting. And sometimes it's going back to the basics. So this morning, I would like to go back to the basics and say, ladies and gentlemen, this is a church, and I would like to tell you how we got here and what we're doing here, and that doesn't actually start with church because we are way downstream in the sequence from how we got here because it starts actually with God, and so I want to give you a thesis that's going to lead us to what's happening today in this room. Uh, so here's the thesis, that God is doing something in the world, and God is on a mission to redeem people from all nations so that they may enjoy and exalt him forever. If you were to go to heaven and knock on the door of God and say, God, uh, I'd like to know what's on your to-do list today. God would say, glad you asked. Today on my to-do list is to redeem people from all nations so that they may enjoy me and exalt me forever. And you're like, cool, God, sounds good. What about tomorrow? You free tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow I will be redeeming people from all nations so they might enjoy me and exalt me forever. Okay, cool, so you're busy. Six months from now, God, I'd like to... Figure out what are you doing? Um, let me check. Six months, I will be redeeming people from all nations so that they might enjoy me and exalt me forever. Okay, God, what are you doing for like all time, end times? Like what's going on here? I will be redeeming people from all nations so they might enjoy me and exalt me forever. This is the ultimate aim of God, purpose of God. It is on his to-do list today. It will be on his list tomorrow. That's what he's doing, and he's been doing it since Genesis chapter 2. In Latin, this is called the Missio Dei, the mission of God. We want to talk about this today, not just as like God, because God is not just any kind of God. Our first truth is that God is a missionary God. How do I know this? This, this is the story from the Old Testament. I'm going to read these to you quickly. Um, but that God's been doing something in the world from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. In Genesis 12, you have Abraham. And it, he calls Abraham and he says in verse 1, Go from your country, your people, and your father's house to the land I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing, and I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So I'm doing something here that's going to affect all peoples. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Does Isaac get the same thing? Let's see, Genesis 26, verse 4. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them all these lands and your offspring, and through your offspring... All nations on earth will be blessed. Okay, that's two generations. So far, so good. What about Jacob? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Does the plan change at Jacob? Genesis 28. Your descendants, Jacob, will be like the dust of the earth, and you'll spread out from the east and to the west, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. That is what God is doing. Then all the people are enslaved to Pharaoh. God sends Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. In Exodus 14, God says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. God is doing stuff, even in the brokenness, to draw people to himself for his glory. Psalm 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Most people stop right there. They're like, I love that verse. God's going to be gracious to me, going to bless me. I could actually use some more face shine. Like I, God's giving out face shine. 
Like, you know how much that stuff costs at Ulta, face shine? It's like expensive. And the serum I'm using ain't working. So God gives face shine and blessing and grace. Sign me up. I love Psalm 67. Why does he do that? God will bless you, be gracious to you. His face will shine on you so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Isaiah 43, don't be afraid, I'm with you. I'll bring your children from the east and gather them from the west. I'll say to the north, give them up into the south. Don't hold them back. Bring your sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. God says they're mine. Everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory and whom I formed and made. They're mine. So what am I doing tomorrow? I'm getting back what's mine. Because I love them, I created them, I'm pursuing them, even though they're running from me, even though they're my enemies actively working against me, my posture towards them is love and pursuit. I'm a missionary God. I'm coming after you. And the story doesn't just stop in the Old Testament. It continues in the New Testament when God himself doesn't stay distant, but rather enters the story to continue the mission. His commitment to his plan is so strong that God does the unimaginable. In John 3, 16, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life, for God did not send his son to the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. John chapter 4, Jesus and the woman at the well, the disciples show up at the end, and Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. John 5, verse 24, truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Jesus is like, I was sent by the Father to bring his children from death to life. They're living in death, and he hates that for them, so he has sent me to do everything necessary so they can be reconciled to God forever, because what's on my Father's to-do list is to redeem people from all nations so they might enjoy and exalt him forever. John chapter 5, verse 37, as the Father sent me, he testifies of me, you've neither heard his voice nor seen his form. Jesus is like the God who's doing all that in the Old Testament. I am his representative. I am him. We are one, John 17. He's praying for the disciples. He says, as you have sent me into the world, now I send them into the world. In John 20, 21, he tells his disciples, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Church, there's over 40, sorry, there's over 60 references of Jesus being sent in the gospel of John alone. 60 references. What this means theologically is that Jesus is the outworking of the missionary nature of the eternal triune God. He is a sent one. He's not just a a savior or a king. He's a missionary king, a missionary savior, a missionary servant. And growing up, I did not hear this. If you grew up in the church, often becoming like Jesus was framed around like what kind of music you listened to or what kind of people you hung out with or what kind of clothes you wore, what kind of things you were into. It was always framed around, if you want to be like Jesus, you need to get your act together. It's about holiness, and that's, that's fine, that's legit. But never did I hear, or rarely did I hear, the thing you could do to be most like Jesus is live a life of incarnational ministry of becoming like those in your neighborhood, living towards those in your neighborhood, taking on the missional nature of God. Even Christmas is all about God being with us, Emmanuel. God is with us. It's so great, and we drink hot chocolate, and we love that God is with us, and we give each other presents because of how good it is. It's not a story that's told that you and I were in the darkness, and we were enemies of God, and he had to send his son Jesus into the darkness to rescue us from death. It's often like good and cheese, you know, and easy, and, and rarely do you hear You were saved to be sent. Often you hear you were saved out of the big bad world. Now stay out of the big bad world. If you were saved from this scene, never go back to that scene. Pretty much the longer you stay a Christian, the the more you have non-Christian, the the less you have non-Christian friends. It's like a, think of it like a triangle. The longer you are a Christian at the top of the triangle, you start to have less and less Christian friends. And then one day you wake up, you've been walking with Jesus 40 years and you can't name someone who doesn't know Jesus. It's not framed as missionary. We have relegated missionary to the special people. And we said, for the rest of us, we just stay here and we do this thing. Theologian John Stott says, the God of the Old Testament is a missionary God. The Christ of the Gospels is a missionary Christ. The Spirit in the book of Acts is a missionary spirit. The church in the epistles is a missionary church. And the book of Revelation is a missionary consummation. 
And so if God is a missionary God, then downstream from that, God's mission has a church. Every single church that's ever been created should be about participating in God's mission. Churches do not get to decide their own mission. They don't get to do their own thing. They are always subservient to Jesus and his mission, and we must recapture the missionary nature of the church. The church doesn't send missionaries. The church is the missionary. At an identity level, this is who we are. We're missionary people sent to participate with the missionary God who's doing what? Reconciling all people to himself so they may enjoy him and exalt him forever. So not only is God on mission, not only is Jesus on mission, not only is the Spirit on mission, he's invited us to participate in mission. So Matthew 28, this is like the classic verse about this, where if you've ever gone on a mission trip, you have a T-shirt with this Bible verse on it. Maybe they give you a coffee mug or a journal, but somewhere in your life you have this Bible verse It is the most read, most underutilized verse, maybe in the whole Bible. Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Wow. Resurrected Christ, telling the disciples what is their job now. He says, you're going to do what my father's been doing since Genesis 1. Pursuing people from all nations for himself. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. So not only do we have a mission that's connected to God, and his mission has us as a church, we now have the mandate within the mission, which is this. Disciple-making is the primary task of the church in fulfillment of the Great Commission. This is now what we do. We don't do it alone. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and he tells them, you're going to do this, but you're going to do it in the power of the Spirit. But it's so easy to forget, so easy to prioritize other things. Just a few weeks after resurrected Jesus gives the Great Commission, he talks to them again in the book of Acts. The last thing Jesus says to his disciples, Acts chapter 1, verse 6. The disciples gathered around him and they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Last conversation with Jesus. He's about to ascend to the right hand of the Father forever. And they say, Jesus, I'm so glad you're back. Real quick, could we get a sermon series on the book of Revelation real quick? Like, I'm so glad you're here. We've been really worried about end times. Like, how's this thing going to end? Is it now? Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Are you going to wait a little bit? Like, how's that going to happen? We've been meaning to ask you, actually. We love that you said, like, that whole thing about going and make disciples of all nations. Like, cool, 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 cool. But, like, what about end times? Verse 7, Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times of the date the Father set for his own authority. He's gracious. Jesus is so gracious. He's like, it's not the main thing, guys. It's important, but it's not like the main thing. Verse 8, what's the main thing? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He does not say you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my Bible studiers. You guys are going to study the Bible. It's going to be amazing. You're going to learn Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. It's going to be awesome. You're going to sound really smart. You'll just say a few words in those languages that nobody speaks now. But like the ancient man, it's like you, you're going to receive power and you will be my worship singers. You're not going to believe this in the future. Like the most popular music in all of contemporary Christian music is going to be worship music. If you really want to make a bunch of money in that world, you just write worship songs. Is this getting too much? Okay, I, I, my staff tells me I need to chill out sometimes. I can feel it happening right now. Um, I'll chill out. He doesn't say you're going to receive power and you're going to be my church attenders. And you're going to come to a church and you're going to sit in rows and you're going to look at one guy use his gift. Maybe a band, they'll use their gifts too. And that, that church on Sundays is going to have um, really nice coffee, which we do, by the way. Um, And I believe honors Jesus very much. Uh, Cold brew, the Lord will speak about in the end times. Um, It's just not the main thing. He says, the main thing is when I give you power, it's going to be so that you're my witnesses. So that you can be the thing that you're unable to be without my spirit. It's easy to sit in a row and listen to a guy talk. It's hard to go out into the world and to tell of the glory of what God is doing in your life and beyond. And so what happens is uh, these disciples, they hear that and they're like, okay. And then the apostle Peter, who just denied Jesus like earlier, a few months, maybe a month earlier, he stands up at Pentecost. He starts preaching the gospel. 
He tells everybody the good news. And, and the Holy Spirit falls like fire from heaven at the first sermon given with the gospel. Signifying that God's presence is with this message. And then the most miraculous thing happens where everybody hears this message in their own heart language. So wait a minute, the first time the gospel's preached, all nations hear it in their own language. It's as if God had something on his to-do list that day. God, what are you doing at Pentecost? I will be redeeming people from all nations so that they might enjoy me and exalt me forever. So much so that when this brother preaches the gospel in his language, I'm just going to make everybody hear it in their own language because that's how much I love these people. And the church has made that about supernatural giftings and what was really going on there. When, when God is saying, welcome to the mission, church, Welcome to what I've been doing since the book of Genesis. Welcome to the mission, church. And then this burst, this gospel being planted, birthed a new people called the church. And then you, you're not going to believe this. They just start hanging out together all the time. In Acts chapter 2, this new people, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and wonder based on what was happening. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold possessions and property and gave it to those who had need. Every day they met together. They broke bread in homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. Now, I know that most leaders are supposed to have innovative, crazy, cool ideas that you follow based on their own inspiration. But church, I lay before you that I have nothing better than what we see here in Acts chapter 2. That we have the gospel being planted, a new community being formed, and then them eating together, praying together in favor of their neighborhood, wherever they are, and then God will add to their number daily. I'm going to believe that that is still God's design to fulfill the Great Commission. And therefore, we must organize our churches around the best way to do the mission that God is already doing right now. And disciple making can't happen in this environment. I talk to pastors, and we talk about disciple making. You'll say, Pastor, what are you doing to make disciples? They say, I preach the Bible. Like, cool, great, good. should, that's awesome, great job. What else? Bible, preaching, like a lot, like a lot, like 52 weeks a year, like everybody else. Yep, pre pre preaching that Bible. Me too, bro. <laughs> like, what else? When you take the average, typical church leader's way of making disciples and you put it next to Jesus, very quickly you see inconsistencies because Jesus spent every day with his people. They say that 70% of disciple making is informal. It's not formal. This is not a disciple making environment. We need dailiness. We need to be around each other. We, we need to see each other when our house is a mess, see each other, fight with each other. We need to do it in a different way. We need another space. And so for us at Grace Church, our other space is called house church. We don't do connect groups. We don't do life groups. We don't do small groups. We do house church. Does it sound like all that other stuff? Yes. But what's different about this is that it's being led by a man and a woman who have biblical characteristics about them that you can model your life after their life. And they are seeking to make disciples to create a family that lives on mission in their geographical location or their life stage. That's the best we could come up with. And so house churches are the vehicle by which we try to do family, mission, witness, care, prayer, Bible study, and discipleship. All of it. We believe that. Right now, we have 33 house churches. We have 84 house church leaders and 712 people on the house church roster. This is where we stand right now. And by God's grace, we are helping each of those house churches do the Great Commission in their neighborhood or in their life stage. And they should be aiming at these things, family closeness, closeness. There should be people in the church that can come over to your house and open the door without knocking and you not feel panicked. They should be able to walk into your kitchen and open the refrigerator and drink your milk and you not think that's weird. How many people in the church could drink milk out of your fridge and you not be like, well, that's a little weird. Now, there are some people that that would be weird and that's like, keep note of them too. But there should be some people where you're like, yeah, who can just pour a bowl of cereal at your house? You'd be like, yeah, that's about normal. That's family closeness. If your biological brother or sister came over and just started eating your cereal, you'd be like, yeah, that's just kind of what they do. 
That level of family closeness. We want you to have people who love you and know you and see you and check on you. And if you miss a few weeks, they're, they're reaching out to you. They're coming to your house. Or if you're in the hospital, they're visiting you in the hospital. Or, or they're taking you flowers when you're celebrating or when you're sad. Or they're bringing you meals if you're having a baby or if you've lost a loved one. You're doing life together, trying your best to eat as much as possible together, to talk as much as possible together, and to do as much dailiness as possible. That's why geography matters. Who you live close to matters. There's like three people in our house church that go to the same elementary school. That geographical thing matters. Or life stage, if you have the same rhythm of life, that matters. You need to be cared for by your church. And there's too many of us for just one single pastor to care for you. So we have 10 elders Each of those elders is assigned three or four house churches, and they provide oversight theologically, uh, protection theologically, and they provide care and encouragement to those leaders. And we want you to have that so that when you're in the hospital, somebody from your house church can visit you. We've seen house churches baptize people. We love it. We've seen house church leaders officiate weddings. We love it. We've, We've equipped them to go and visit in the hospital. We want your house church leaders to be your shepherds and to care for you and to love you and to serve you. And we want to give oversight. We had something happen in the life of our church uh, a couple weeks ago where where, uh, a a girl house church leader lost her dad. And uh, I was really connected to that. And it was interesting to me that I was connected to that family, not as the lead pastor of Grace Church. I was connected to that family because I'm the elder that oversees her house church. And I'm for her. And I'm connected there. And I love them because... God's asked me to do that, and he's asked us to build the world around mission so that people can be cared for. You should open your Bible and pray at house church. Now, there is a, there's a wide spectrum of how this plays out. There's some house church leaders among us that are like studying the Bible every single week, and if you show up and you didn't do your homework, maybe that you're going to feel a little bit behind or something. They're all in, and there's others over here that are like, we're just trying to throw a really fun dinner party that my neighbors would come to and not feel like we're a bunch of weirdos. So there's a spectrum there. I don't know which house church you go to. Usually these guys think they're better than those guys, and those guys think they're better than these guys, and we love watching it play out. It's so fun. (laughs) We're just like, hey, do you, and see what happens. But by design, every time you gather, you eat. It's spiritual. Have you ever gone to a small group that didn't eat food? It's like not as fun. So you eat together every single time, and you have a meaningful conversation every single time. And there's a question of how do you do child care? Good luck. Good luck with that. Some, some people have child care. We have like a tip jar where uh, high school kids come and watch kids and we tip them. Others have like free range parenting house church where you've got little kids running everywhere. You're holding the baby and they're like, congratulations on the baby. You're like, this is not my child. I, somebody handed me this kid when I walked in. I don't know who this belongs to. Before I leave, I will walk around saying, whose baby have I been holding for an hour? That happens too. I've seen that. More than once. Some meet outside, some meet inside, but they eat, they, con- they, they connect over food, they pray for each other, they open the word. Most of them talk about the sermon. But by design, they, they're on mission together. They're on mission together with the intent of growing deep and wide. The Great Commission has implicitly designed the church to be deep and wide. Teach people all that I've commanded. That's deep. That we should be rooted in the teachings of Jesus. We should understand how to obey the teaching of Jesus. That is deep. But wide is also this, so that you can make disciples of all nations. That's as wide as it gets. You should never pit width against depth and go, man, Grace Church is growing too wide. Let's grow as wide as possible. As wide as possible. Because any church that grows wide must also grow deep or it's not going to sustain the width. And any church that grows deep naturally should grow wise. We should vigorously pursue both, and house church is a great place for that to happen. We want mission to happen in house churches. We would love to stop promoting mission trips at our church. But rather you have house churches going, hey, we're going to go down to Spectrum Ministries in Tijuana and do stuff there. Hey, we're going to do foster care ministry with Olive Crest because that's what our house church is passionate about. Hey, uh, Scott, Shauna, you you guys don't have to announce mission trips anymore because we've got hundreds of people in house churches that are connecting with Jesse and Desiree, and they're going to go to Guatemala in hope of life. Like church, we see house churches as the primary place of mission, and it's a a localized mission because when you have non-believing friends, your first thought should be, how do I get these friends to meet people in my house church? 
How do I get my friends to meet my friends? Often we talk about mission as this big, crazy thing when really it's just my friends meeting my other friends. And that's how the church drags people in and doesn't do outreach, but rather does in drag. And the Spirit empowers us for witness. In an increasingly post-Christian world, people out there in San Diego are going to be less and less interested in coming to church on a Sunday. But in an increasingly spiritual world, people out there are going to be more and more interested in Jesus. So you've got people more and more interested in Jesus and less and less interested in the church. What does that mean? It means we must carry the gospel outside the walls of the church. We must be people that carry the gospel outside the walls of the church. That's how it has to happen. A couple of weeks ago in our house church, we were telling stories about how we first came to faith and how we got re-energized by faith. And a guy in our house church said, he said, about a year ago, I was taking the trash out. And then my neighbor had a pest control guy smoking gophers in the yard, like trying to smoke out, not smoking gophers, that sounds bad, smoking out gophers. (laughs) I'm just going to move on, okay, because that's, that could mean so many things. I'm just going to move on. And so my friend taking out the trash was like, hey, I have gophers in my yard. Can I get a business card? It's like, yeah. Gives him a business card, calls him up. A month later, he's at his house smoking out gophers, and they're talking. Apparently, smoking out gophers takes a lot of time, multiple visits. And so as they're sitting there watching the smoke do its thing, gopher guy starts talking to my friend in house church and says, hey, man, like, tell me about yourself. And they're talking, and eventually he says, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Gopher guy, ask my house church guy. You have a relationship with Jesus? He's like, ah, you know, not really, kind of. And Gopher Guy's like, bro, you should, you should consider Jesus. Here's what he's done in my life. Here's how he's been awesome for me. Like, man, Jesus has made, meant the world to me, transformed me. Here's who I used to be. Here's who I am now. And, and so they're just having this conversation. And ultimately, that led my friend to recommit his faith to Jesus, ultimately come to Grace Church, and, and now is committed to our house church. He beat me in pickleball a couple weeks ago. Like, he's like in all because Gopher Guy decided I'm not just a pest control person. I carry with me the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm committed to the mission of God. And so be careful booking me for gopher finding because you may get a new soul out of it. That's the design of the church. We have to carry the gospel outside of the church. And so what we are trying to do is equip you to be people that do that. But then when you do that, you don't have to invite them here first. You invite them to a dinner party happening in your neighborhood first. And they meet other people, and they're like, man, it turns out Christians aren't as weird as I thought. Well, there's a couple weirdos over there. But, like, the rest of you are, like, generally pretty cool. The one guy eating cereal in the corner, maybe not so much. But, like, and they see the community of Jesus before they have faith in Jesus. And the hospitality of that house church starts to bless them and serve them. And ultimately, they come one day, and they meet all these house churches. And they're like, wow, this is awesome. What happens on Sunday, by design, is just a collection of house churches that have been fighting to do life daily together. And once a week, we gather and we have the Super Bowl, the celebration on Sundays. And then we go back and we participate in dailiness in our neighborhood. So as we chart the course for our church, you go, what's the future that we're trying to do for our church? Here's it. Here's the future. We want to be a Great Commission church, fueled by the Great Commission, making disciples, resilient disciples, seeking to saturate San Diego with house churches. That's the course we're on. We want the Great Commission to guide us, God's mission to guide us, making disciples who can endure in in a world where everybody who follows Jesus, it seems like they fall away or is soft. We want to be resilient in our walk with Jesus, and we want to saturate the city with house churches, that everybody in the city is close to a house church. This is our current picture of house churches right now. This is where we are. That one way up there in Oregon is just Poway. And, uh, and that one in Arizona, that's, uh, that's Alpine uh, out there. Um, that's, that's not Las Vegas, that's Alpine. Um, that's currently where we are. So we have not yet saturated the city with house churches, but that's the hope. And then here's what happens over time. If we do this, you plant the gospel. The gospel creates a new people called a church. Those people start to gather together in homes because that's the design of dailiness and life together. And then they start to be an expression of the gospel in their neighborhood And then by design, that keeps multiplying. And before you know it, you've got a group out here who thinks to themselves, you know what? It might be better for us to have a Sunday gathering closer to our location so that we could better serve our contextualized environment, our city, where we are. And then it would look something like this, where the next graphic is that those nine house churches, which, by the way, I made this graphic by myself. Okay, don't judge me, people. This is is like me 
putting an X on Microsoft Word and dragging it over to a photo, okay? And someone on our team was like, Josh, it looks like you killed seven house churches. And I'm like, we didn't, we didn't kill them, we sent them. Um, but what happens, you plant the gospel, new communities created, that community wants an expression on Sundays, and so you start to plant house churches, ultimately you will plant a church where God will raise up a pastor in that neighborhood. God will raise up leaders, and then those house churches join that church. And so you don't plant a church by planting a worship service, but rather you have 90 people already gathering, and they start a church. Now, that's all fun and games to talk about, unless you're one of those exes. And you're like, wait a second, Josh, are you saying that we're planting a church? Um, No, I'm saying the New Testament never commands us to plant a church. It tells us to plant the gospel, make disciples, And then if you do that, you're going to get church planting. So I don't know the future, but I can tell you, if we commit to planting the gospel and making disciples, then we will ultimately plant churches because that's a part of God's mission. So I know many of you are looking up there and you're like, is my house church in that X? Does that mean I can't come back here anymore? No, that's not what it means. It just means inevitably that leads to churches being planted. That's the design. That is the picture. And that is no easy task, but that is what happens. And our hope is that we would put Christian community at the center of mission. Are we doing it right now? Not yet. Maybe. Maybe we are. Maybe we're going to plant a church. You guys want to? Maybe not. Maybe we are. I'm just trying. <laughs> I genuinely don't know. Or do I? No, I don't know. God knows. God knows. Yes. And we will make him laugh with our plans. Um, I'm just telling you what's possible. And I'm telling you right now, it's hard to find a seat in our services. And so what if instead of adding services, we added churches? So it's possible. But the key for all of this to work is that you and I have to stop believing that the Great Commission is for someone else. We've got to stop believing that sharing the gospel is for someone else. And we have to start believing that if I am a follower of Jesus, then I am invited to participate in the mission. More than that, I'm commanded to participate in the mission. And so you, you go, what do I do, Josh? Make your house church a priority in your life. And don't show up as a consumer, like bring food, stay late, do the dishes, you know, sweep the floor, be, be a contributor to your house church, be bought into your house church, like participate, do life with these people and watch how over time it transforms you. It moves you. Fight for dailiness. Try to spend time together. If you're going to Costco, text people from your house church. Hey, I'm going to Costco. Does anybody need anything? Hey, I'm going to Home Depot. Me, my house church leader owns a truck. I do not, so I'm jealous of him. But so I borrowed his truck. He took me to Home Depot one night. And we had one of the most meaningful conversations we've had at Home Depot waiting on the forklift to bring down something from the top level. Because that's what dailiness looks like. You go, hey, you want to have a really meaningful conversation? You've got to get at Home Depot, aisle 18, and start talking about, like, you can't plan that. It's what dailiness is. So contribute to your house church. Fight for dailiness. Invite people into dailiness. And then lastly, look at your life and see one, is there one person who doesn't know Jesus in your life that you could introduce to your friends in your house church? Who's the one person you go, man, I need to go to the beach with you friend who doesn't know Jesus, and all my house church friends that know Jesus. Like, you need to meet these people. Because that's what mission looks like. You talk about the mission of God and all the things God is doing. You go, what does it mean for me? It means invite your non-Christian friends into the life of community. And show them the gospel as you explain to them the gospel. Show them the world that Jesus creates as you invite them into that world. And I submit to you, God will go before you to do this. And if we do this, then... Ladies and gentlemen, we have a church. This is the design of the church. This is who we are to be, and when we are these things, God goes before us. And it's glorious, and it's life-giving, and it's fun. It's not extra. It feels like the best. It feels like the abundant life. It feels like the joy of the abundant life. And so I want to invite you to participate in the mission of God as Grace Church and chart the course for what he could do in us if we are obedient to his design. So I want to pray that we would be this kind of people. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your design. Thank you for the model of the early church. God, I know that you are, you're still doing what you do. You're still redeeming people from all nations. You're just inviting us to participate. So God, would you help us participate? Would you give us courage 
to, to speak up and invite our non-Christian friends in the community, invite people to church, invite people to a conversation about Jesus. Would you give us that courage, Lord? And would you help us organize our calendars in such a way that we could be daily connecting with our Christian friends in our house church? And Father, would you, would you give us a burden for our neighborhoods? Would you help us to saturate this whole city with little lights in the darkness, little, little communities within the community, little outposts for the kingdom? God, we need your help in this. And Father, now I pray that you would turn our eyes and our thoughts to someone in our life who doesn't know Jesus. God, bring that person to mind. And then would you give us the courage to invite that person into community with us? Whether that's the beach or coffee date or going on a walk or the movies or just whatever, God, could you help us to invite these people, even before they believe, God, help us to invite them to belong. We need your help, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.